Our theme this evening is then, what is the free offer of the gospel? What is the free offer of the gospel? We saw last month, when we were looking at the five points of Calvinism, that man uh, in his sin is totally depraved and utterly unable and unwilling by nature to turn to God that God has unconditionally elected and predestinated unto salvation a definite multitude which no man can number from amongst mankind and that the Lord Jesus Christ died specifically and only to save them and that God's grace in the heart of the elect is efficacious that is it ensures the conversion of all the elect of God at the time appointed by God and that those who are thus effectually called to faith in Christ will certainly be caused to persevere in that faith. This, when first received and believed, tends to raise questions in the mind of a Christian regarding the preaching of the gospel. The question often runs something like this. If God has predestinated who will be saved and who will not be saved, and he has, then do we preach the gospel to everyone? And if we do, what do we say? Uh, now, the following preliminary points need to be clear before we get into the free offer question itself properly. First of all, the gospel contains a command to believe. The gospel contains a command to believe. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 5, the apostle says, By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations. In chapter 16 of Romans and verse 26, speaking of the gospel, it is, but now it made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of Likewise, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 8, the Lord Jesus is said to be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Now that verse, in the same verse, you have the doctrine of reprobation, that the non-elect are appointed to stumbling at the word and yet it is this still described as disobedience so that to which they are appointed by the decree of God is still called disobedience to the gospel a failure to do what God commands them to do in the preaching of the gospel in chapter 4 and verse 17 for the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God and if it first begin at us what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God them that obey not the gospel contains a command there is it is a gospel that is to be obeyed and so consequently unbelief is sin so the Lord Jesus in John 16 9 having said when he the spirit of truth is come to convince the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment he said of sin because they believe not on me that is their unbelief is sin or in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12 Take heed, brethren, lest there be in you, any of you, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. 
And then in verse uh, 17, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So they sinned by believing not. So the gospel contains a command to believe, and uh, unbelief is sin against God. God commands repentance. Acts 17 verse 30, uh, the times of his ignorance God winked at, but now God, God commanded all men everywhere to repent. Isaiah 45 22, look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. God commands sinners in the gospel to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and not to do so is an additional sin, uh, an additional cause of guilt on those who do not believe. Now then, Arminianism and hyper-Calvinism, the proper sense of the word, have one mistake, one error in common. Both Arminianism, that is the false doctrine of free will, and hyper-Calvinism, which denies that the gospel is to be preached to all or denies that men are duty-bound to believe it, they have this same error in common that God cannot command men to do as a duty what man is unable to do on account of his fall into sin. They both share that error that God cannot command men to do what men on account of their sin are unable to do. The Arminian says God does command men to repent and believe Therefore, men must be able to repent and believe. The hyper-Calvinist says uh, men are not able to repent and believe, therefore it cannot be so that God commands them to repent and believe. Both are wrong and rest on the false idea that God cannot rightly command men to do what their sin has rendered them unable to do. The Biblical Calvinistic teaching is that God commands that men must repent and believe even though men are not able or willing to do so unless God works effectively in them by his Spirit, something which he may or may not do according to his sovereign election. God can command sinners to repent even though unless he changes their hearts they are unable to repent. God's sovereign power over men does not take away or reduce his sovereign authority to command men. I'll say that one again. God's sovereign power over men does not take away his sovereign authority to command men. So the gospel contains a command to sinners to do what apart from the regenerating work of the Spirit in them they never will be able to do. Because God is still God, he has sovereign power over the will of man and sovereign authority to command man. He has abdicated neither of those things. Man is both dependent upon the power of God and also absolutely obliged to do whatever God tells him to do. But now another position has uh, appeared on the scene it's, uh, and claims wrongly to represent the Reformed faith. Now this view says that there is a command to sinners to repent and believe but that there is no offer 
of the gospel, expressive of God's loving kindness to all who hear it. So then, what is the biblical free offer of the gospel? First of all, what the free offer is not. What the free offer is not. It is not the use of the appeal system. The free offer of the gospel is not the use of the appeal system. There are those who think that to believe in the free offer of the gospel means believing in the use of the appeal system of getting people uh, to come to the front of the meeting, to put their hand up, to sign a decision card, to say a wee prayer after the evangelist and then tell them he's saved and so on. They think that that is part and parcel of the free offer of the gospel and that if you reject that appeal system then you may justly be labeled a hyper Calvinist. That is absolutely untrue. The appeal system is utterly unbiblical and has no basis whatsoever in terms of the biblical free offer of the gospel. The appeal system that is getting people uh, to perform some physical act uh, that is made more or less equivalent to, or said to be more or less equivalent to, be, to conversion is an invention, a human invention. It stems from Arminianism, pure and simple, and is a clear denial of the need of a sovereign work of the Spirit of God in the soul before anyone is really converted. A man's heart needs to be renewed by the Spirit of God efficaciously, effectively, in order to be able to repent and believe. He does not need to be renewed by the Spirit of God to come to the front of a meeting or to put his hand up or to sign a card or to say the words of a prayer after the evangelist. He can do all of those things without being born again of the Spirit, but he cannot and will not repent and believe unless he is regenerated by the Spirit of God. So the free offer does not consist in the use of the appeal system. Then we may also say the free offer of the gospel does not consist of saying Christ died for you. We saw this in last month's meeting but we'll just mention it again here. The free offer of the gospel does not consist of saying to unconverted men and women, Christ died for you. Christ died for the elect. The elect of God. He came uh, to give his life a ransom for many. He gave, he would lay down his life for the sheep. He loved the church and gave himself for it. His name is Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. For the transgression of my people he was afflicted, and so on. Through those people come from all nations and are sometimes referred to as the world. But it does not mean every individual in the world, otherwise every individual would be saved. He died for the elect, and only the elect. We do not know who the elect are among the unconverted. And since we don't know who the elect are, we cannot say to unconverted people, Christ died for you, because that may not be true. And if we can't say it honestly, then it mustn't need to be said. The apostles never did it. You can search the scriptures and you'll never find the apostles saying to the unconverted, Christ died for you. But they do say is Christ is exalted, a prince and a saviour, for to give repentance unto Israel. So then, that's what it is not. But then secondly, the free offer of the gospel is linked to the kindness that God shows to all men in this life. The free offer of the gospel is linked to the kindness that God shows to all men in this life. 
This doctrine is sometimes known as the doctrine of common grace. It's not necessarily the best term, but it is one that is generally used. But the teaching is that God does show kindness, kindness that does not result in everlasting salvation, but kindness, favor, love to the non-elect in this present life. That God was determined and set his uh, love to all eternity upon the elect and ensured their salvation, nonetheless in this present world shows genuine kindness and benevolence even to those who are not the elect of God. Now this doctrine was denied by the late Herman Herxheimer and uh, the Protestant Reformed Churches of America of which he was one of the founders. And it is still denied by the representatives uh, of that body in this country under uh, the auspices of, known, uh, of a, an organization called the British Reformed Fellowship. Well, let us address the question. First of all, under this main he second heading, God does show kindness to the non-elect in this life. God does show kindness to the non-elect, those not elected e in this present life. God restrains sin, he provides material things, he bestows gifts and abilities upon the non-elect as well as the elect in this present life. It may be argued that this in itself does not demonstrate anything. After all, God restrains his judgments even of demons for his own ends without it being an expression of favor or loving kindness. However, in the case of fallen men in this present life, scripture explicitly tells us that these, this bestowment of good things is an expression of the kindness of God. Luke chapter 6 and verse 35. Luke chapter 6 and verse 35. But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. Ye have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same, and if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So in these passages, God's bestowment of rain and sunshine and so on on men is declared to be an expression of his kindness and love. In Genesis 17:20, God is said to have blessed reprobate Ishmael, Ishmael who was not one of God's elect, as Romans 9 clearly indicates. God shows long suffering to the vessels of wrath, Romans 9:22. What is God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. The guilt of the reprobate, the non-elect, is increased 
by their unthankfulness for genuine blessings received. It is because they are genuine blessings and manifestations of God's loving kindness that their guilt in the abuse of them in the decree of God is so great. Romans 1, 21, neither were they thankful. Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. Romans 2 verse 4. Or despise thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds. Now in that particular passage, the apostle is demonstrating the guilt of the Jews. In chapter 1 he's shown that the Gentiles are all guilty and under wrath. And here he's showing that the Jews are likewise guilty, reaching the conclusion that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is absolutely no possibility of restricting verse 4 to the elect of God. It cannot be done without resting the scriptures in a most shameful manner. And it says, For despiseth thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering. This indicates that even the non elect are the objects of divine goodness, forbearance, and long suffering in this present life. When the apostle says, Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, he is speaking of what ought to be the effect of the goodness of God upon them. He is not saying that God, uh, God's goodness fails to achieve that which God has determined it will achieve. No. But he is saying that it ought, that they are guilty in being the objects of such goodness and still remaining unrepentant. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 and verse 21. The rich young ruler who comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark 10, 21. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, and so on. So there in verse 21. Jesus, beholding him, loved him. Then in verse 22, And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Christ is said to have loved this rich young ruler, but there is no evidence that he was ever converted. And so John Calvin says on this passage, the young man, who had brought both a desire to learn and modesty, withdrew from Christ because it was hard to part with a darling vice. The same thing will happen to us unless the sweetness of the grace of Christ render all the allurements of the flesh distasteful to us. Whether or not this temptation was temporary so that the young man afterwards repented, we know not but it may be conjectured with probability that his covetousness kept him back from making any proficiency. So there Calvin, knowing that the text says Christ loved him, nevertheless says it is most probable that this young man was never converted. That is, that he was not one of the elect of God. The point here is not simply that Calvin thought he was probably never converted, but that he says this knowing that the text says Christ loved him. So that Calvin approached this text with no presupposition at all to the effect that God never shows loving kindness to the non-elect in this life. He does not say because it says Christ loved him, he must be one of the elect. Because Calvin did believe that God shows loving kindness to the non-elect in this present life. 
He loves the elect to eternity and brings them to everlasting salvation. But he shows his kindness for a season in this life to the non-elect according to his sovereign good pleasure. And then we must say, this accounts for the command that we must love our neighbor without our knowing whether he is one of God's elect. This accounts for the command that we must love our neighbor without knowing whether he is one of God's elect. We are commanded to love our neighbor as ourselves, even to love our enemies. We do not know which unconverted neighbors are the elect and which are non-elect. But we are commanded to love our neighbor anyway. And we are commanded to do so, not because of what we do not know, but of, because of what we do know. So in Matthew chapter 5, which we read earlier, the command to love our enemies is not based on our ignorance, but on our knowledge. Verse 44, But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you, and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just, and on the unjust. Verse 48, Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Our love is to be patterned after God's, both in its nature and in its objects. The reason we are to love our neighbor, whether he is elect or reprobate, and we do not know, is because being patterned after God, God himself, Shows loving kindness to uh, the children of men, elect, yes, and reprobate in this present life. With the elect, he is determined to actually save them, to renew their hearts and bring them to faith in Christ. He has loved them uh, with an everlasting self to bestow an everlasting salvation. That is not true of the non elect, but nonetheless, the gifts he bestows upon the non elect are genuine expressions of his sovereign benevolence in this present world. Because that is so, and our love is to be patterned after God's, in this present life we are to love our neighbor without knowing whether they are elect or reprobate or non-elect. God does not command us to show love to those whom he does not show love to himself. That ought to be clear to everyone, that, if, that God does not tell us to love those whom he does not love in any sense or in any way. Because our love is to be patterned after God's. And so if God, as Herximer and the British Reformed Fellowship would have us believe, if God, with respect to the non-elect, has only, even in this life, absolute and unmitigated, and in every sense, only hatred, then how can God command us to love what he does not? The idea is absurd. And this also explains why in heaven we will not be troubled or distressed by the miseries of the lost. God shows love to the non-elect in this life, and we are to be patterned after God, and to love men without knowing whether they are elect in this life. God does not show love to the non-elect in hell, and we will be patterned after God and our minds will be conformed to the mind of God. And therefore he does not love them in hell, and neither will we. Now of course, because we're still in this life, we find it virtually impossible to envisage ourselves in that position. I understand that. But 
our love is to be patterned after God. God shows loving kindness even to the non-elect as well as the elect in this life, so must we. In the world to come, God shows no loving kindness to the non-elect in their lost condition. Neither will we. We are to be patterned after God. This conformity of human love commanded and of divine love is exemplified in the person of Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is one person in two distinct natures. But there is never any conflict while he was in this world between the two natures. In other words, the human and the divine nature of Christ were always in perfect harmony. So he didn't love with one nature and not the other. Now Christ was made under the law, the law which says thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. The law which says love thy neighbour, not thy neighbour who is elect, or thy neighbour in case is elect, he is elect, but thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Christ fulfilled as a man that command of the law of God. He loved his neighbour as himself as we ought to do. And in so doing, there was no conflict between the human nature of Christ loving his neighbour, elect and reprobate, and the divine nature, as if the divine nature only loved the elect and only showed love to the elect, whereas in the human nature, in conformity to the law of God, he showed love to elect and reprobate. Such a division of the person of Christ is actually heretical. So there is no conflict in the person of Christ between the two natures as to to whom he should show loving kindness in this present life. He loved so as to redeem. His redeeming love was toward the elect. But he loved his neighbor in accordance with God's law, elect and reprobate, and without conflict, between the divine and human nature. God loves the elect to all eternity and has decreed their everlasting salvation, but he manifests his love for a time in this world even to the non-elect. And both his electing love and his kindness to the non-elect in this life are undeserved and towards those who in themselves are obnoxious to him and deserve nothing but his immediate and everlasting wrath. Now then, thirdly, the third main point, the free offer of the gospel is an expression of this divine loving kindness. The free offer of the gospel is an expression of this divine loving kindness. First. It is an expression of God's kindness to those who desperately need Christ, not as though Christ needed them. It is because sinners need Christ and salvation in him that this kindness is expressed to them in the gospel. The point I'm getting at here is that Arminianism has led to something worse and that is Christ being presented as lonely and in need of sinners. That is absolutely wrong. Christ does not need sinners. Sinners need the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is a sovereign expression of the kindness of the Lord from the throne of his glory that he sends overtures of mercy to the children of men, so that the apostles could say, to you is this word of salvation sent. Then we must also remember, it is an expression of divine benevolence and loving kindness, but not of divine frustration. It is an expression of divine benevolence and loving kindness but not 
divine frustration. God is never frustrated. God's love achieves all that it intends. His electing love achieves the salvation of the elect as he intended. Likewise, his love in this world to the non-elect, it achieves all that it is intended to achieve. The rain falls and the sunshine shines on the non-elect and it does so to the extent and for as long as God has determined in his good pleasure that it shall do. Likewise, if he has purposed to send the overture of the gospel to them as an expression of his loving kindness, but without enabling them to repent and believe and be saved, then that is exactly what takes place. What he has determined shall take place, does take place. And if he has determined with respect to many non-elect sinners, but he will show loving kindness in this life by sending the overture of the gospel to them, but not giving them the enabling of his spirit so that they repent and believe. If that is what he has determined, then it's exactly what happens. The gospel goes to them, and the loving kindness of God is expressed to them in the overtures of the gospel, and yet he has decreed not to give them that new heart whereby they would be enabled to repent and believe. And God's love achieves exactly in that case, as in all others, what he intended to achieve. The display of his kindness to them in the overture of the gospel. So Samuel Rutherford, who was one of the strictest Calvinists in the Westminster Assembly, a great defender of the doctrine of limited atonement, he spoke on the theme of, or wrote on the theme of, no love of God ineffectual. And he speaks of a love that extends to, quote, even his enemies, makes the sun to shine on the unjust man as well as the just, and causes dew and rain to fall on the orchard and fields of the bloody and deceitful man whom the Lord abhors, as Christ teacheth us, Matthew 5, 43 to 48. Nor doth God miscarry in this love. He sends the gospel to many reprobates and invites them to repentance and with longanimity and forbearance suffereth pieces of froward dust to fill the measure of their iniquity. Yet does not the Lord's general love fall short of what he willeth to them. For those who are interested in the historical side, that's from Samuel Rutherford's work, Christ dying and drawing sinners to himself, page 441. So just as God commands non-elect men to keep his law, and to repent of their sin as an expression of his holiness, but without having decreed to cause them to actually do so, so also he expresses his love in gospel overtures of mercy, which he has not decreed to enable them to respond to. In neither case is there frustration in God, who according to scripture, performs all his prayer pleasure, works all things after the counsel of his own will, and is blessed from her forever. God is always free from frustration and agitation. He is blessed forever. And so the passages which speak of God saying, Oh, that must be understood in this life. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 29. Deuteronomy 5 verse 29. Oh that there was such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 29. 
Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. Psalm 81, which we sang, and verse 13. Psalm 81 and verse 13. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. Isaiah 48 and verse 18. Oh, that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments, then had thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. These are expressions of God's loving kindness, not God's frustration or helplessness. God is never frustrated and never helpless, for he sovereignly expresses his loving kindness in these overtures. Ezekiel 33 and verse 11. Ezekiel 33, 11. Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Attempts have been made to restrict this as being addressed to the elect, but this is quite futile because in verse 9 it says, Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. It is impossible to say that verse 11 does not include those mentioned in verse 9 who do not turn from their wicked way. So it does not refer only to the elect. And the offer of the gospel is an indiscriminate offer. Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Ye come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money? for that which is not bread, and your labour for that which satisfieth not. Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. This gospel invitation is addressed to those who are spending money for that which is not bread and their labor for that which satisfieth not. They are not, con they are not confined, this is not confined to convinced sinners, to regenerate sinners, or to known elect sinners, but to sinners. Regenerate sinners are not spending their money for that which is not bread. And so John Calvin, writing on Ezekiel 18.23, uh, very close to the end of his life, says, Men from despair, that they may apprehend the hope of pardon and repent and embrace the offered salvation. When we turn to the passage we began with, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 19 and 20. Verse 20 speaks of, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. The reconciliation in view is undoubtedly defined for us in verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So the reconciliation in view is the non-imputation of trespasses. It is forgiveness of sin and justification. And in verse 20 you see that the word you is in italics in our King James Version, to show that it is added to give the sense. So it would read, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech by us, 
we pray in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. He is describing his gospel preaching to all men as one of beseeching, God beseeching by him. We pray in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. In verse 21, he is referring particularly to the Corinthian Christians. And it is for that reason that he, said, he, had, he says, He had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin and so on. But in verse 20, he is describing his gospel message preached to all. And he says it is one of beseeching in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. And the preacher's compassion reflects God's compassion. If it doesn't, it shouldn't be there. Men, we are not to show compassion if God doesn't. But in the preaching of the gospel, God does. And the preacher is to reflect that fact. We beseech you in Christ's stead. The preacher is not a machine simply making a tannoy announcement, indifferent to the response, but he is patterned after the Saviour who wept over Jerusalem, Matthew 23, 37 to 38, Luke 19, 41 to 42. The tears of Christ were the tears of his human nature, but the compassion was the sovereign compassion of a divine person. And this free offer of the gospel, we must also say, contains a conditional promise. It contains a conditional promise. Back in Isaiah 55, Isaiah 55 and verse 3, Incline your ear and come unto me, hear and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. That is a conditional promise. It is not Arminianism to say to unconverted sinners, God promises you that if you believe, you will be forgiven and accepted with God. That is not Arminianism. A conditional promise is included in the proclamation of the gospel. So Psalm 95 and verse 7. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. And that's applied in Hebrews chapter 4 to the professing church in the New Testament and yet allowing for the possibility that some within it are not true believers and will perish. Hebrews 4, let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. And he goes on to warn them about the wrath of God upon the unbelieving. But he calls it a promise being promises to the unconverted. Herman Herximer and the British Reformed Fellowship, um, the late Herman Herximer and the British Reformed Fellowship who follow his teaching, they use phrases like the promises are only for the elect that God only makes promises for the elect. What that means is that there are no promises to anybody who is not a Christian, elect or reprobate. Because if the promises are only for the elect, no non-Christian can possibly know whether he is one of God's elect until he is converted. So there are no promises to any non-Christian if the British Reformed Fellowship view were correct. 
this being the case when the apostles said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved what was he telling the man to do the first exercise of faith on this BRF view this anti-free offer view has no promises to embrace because the sinner does not know in advance if he's one of God's elect he's told to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ but there are no promises to take hold of they stand in sharp contrast to the teaching of the Westminster Confession of Faith which in its chapter 14 on saving faith speaks of uh, saving faith including embracing the promises of God and of course Hebrews 11 13 where the faith a chapter on the heroes of faith uh, uh, talks of them they embrace the promises afar off on the Hirshima BRF view there is a command to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ but there are no promises to believe on because they're all for the elect and the unconverted man doesn't know if he's one of the elect there are no promises addressed to him no promises to believe no promises to embrace so what does it mean to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ not merely believing the facts that Christ died for the elect devils can believe that but they're not believing to salvation it's not saving faith there must be a resting upon Christ alone for justification as the Westminster Confession puts it and that means there must be promises in Christ to rest upon so the gospel addresses sinners as sinners with no knowledge in advance of their election and it sends conditional promises to them otherwise there is no gospel sent to anyone at all the idea of condition is not Arminianism the word condition is used in the Westminster Confession of Faith I'm referring to that because I want you to understand that what I'm seeking to declare to you is the biblical teaching as understood historically by the Westminster Assembly and Orthodox Presbyterianism the word condition appears in the Westminster Confession of Faith and it is not used in the sense simply of the mere means of the salvation of the elect but of that which is held out to all men whether according to God's decree it is fulfilled by the individual or not it is even used of Adam of that condition which he did not fulfill in the first covenant so the Westminster Confession chapter 7 paragraph 2 says the first covenant made with man was a covenant of works wherein life was promised to Adam and in him to his posterity upon condition of perfect and personal obedience there you have an unfulfilled conditional promise to Adam in his state of innocency God had decreed that Adam would not fulfill that condition and would not receive the promise but nonetheless it was a real promise and a real condition attached to it the Westminster Assembly were not Arminians and so on the covenant of grace the confession of faith says wherein he freely offereth unto sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ requiring of them faith in him that they may be saved and the larger catechism question 32 how is the grace of God manifested in the second covenant 
the grace of God is manifested in the second covenant in that he freely provided and offereth to sinners a mediator and life and salvation by him and requiring faith as the condition to interest them in him. Uh, and it goes on to talk of God's sovereignty in terms of the outworking of that. But nonetheless, it speaks of condition and promise. There's uh, question 68 of the larger catechism. Are the elect only effectually called? All the elect and they only are effectually called, although others may be and often are outwardly called by the ministry of the word and have some common operations of the spirit who for their willful neglect and contempt of the grace offered to them being justly left in their unbelief do never truly come to Jesus Christ so there it's saying that the non-elect who are never converted have a great, the, it speaks of their contempt of the grace offered to them and the meaning then of the term offer can be deduced also from a work called the practical use of saving knowledge often printed with the Westminster Confession it was written by James Durham and David Dixon and generally accepted in the Scottish Reformed Church. It says uh, under the section on uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 19-21 He that upon the loving request of God and Christ made to him by the mouth of ministers having commissioned to that effect hath embraced the offer of perpetual reconciliation through Christ and doth purpose by God's grace as a reconciled person to strive against sin and to serve God to, the, to his power constantly may be assured to have righteousness and eternal life given to him and so on. The point is the idea of a gracious overture was clearly believed. And then again on 1 John 3.23 it says that if any man shall not be taken with the sweet invitation of God nor with the humble and loving request of God made to him to be reconciled he shall find he have to do with the sovereign authority of the highest majesty for this is the commandment that we believe in him so the idea that the Puritans and the early covenanters believed something other than a gracious invitation and overture in the gospel is entirely wrong Herman Herxheimer denied the whole concept of condition as Arminianism. He criticized the Westminster Confession, but his followers in the BRF who hold his views want to be upholders of the Westminster Confession at the same time. Well, time's gone. Just one or two quotations. I know not all of you will have the same interest in the historical side, but bear with me. First of all, George Gillespie, a member of the Westminster Assembly, says in Aaron's Rod Blossoming, that's the name of his work, page 209, Ministers do indeed offer Christ to all upon condition of believing, being commanded to preach the gospel to every creature and not knowing who are reprobates. His friend Samuel Rutherford says, The condition of the covenant is faith. This do was the condition of the covenant of works. This believe is the condition of this covenant. That's trial and triumph of page 87. John Owen the Puritan says, God, when he proposes the covenant unto us, doth it that we should take up our rest and confidence alone in that. So, when the gospel is preached, there is to be proclaimed from the sovereign God of heaven a gracious a, 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 a benevolent conditional promise to sinners as such and it is entirely consistent with the doctrine of absolute predestination 
This is the expression of this conditional promise is the expression of divine benevolence to all who hear. It by no means suggests uncertainty as to the outcome or as to the decree of God as to who shall certainly by his power be enabled to embrace those promises. But preached it must B. One last quote from Richard Cameron, the covenanter who gave his life for the sake of the gospel, and certainly no million. He says this when preaching in the open air in the fields of Scotland. He says, But I say, our Lord is here this day, saying, Will ye take me, ye that have had a lie so long in your right hand? What say ye to it? You that have been plagued with deadness, hardness of heart and unbelief. He is now requiring you to give in your answer. What say ye, yes or no? What think ye of the offer? And what fault find ye in him? There may be some saying, if I get or take him, I shall get a cross also. Well, that is true, but he will get a sweet cross. Thus we offer him unto you in the parishes of Ockenleck, Douglas, Crawford, John, and all ye, ye that live thereabout. And what say ye? Will ye take him? Tell us what ye say, for we take instruments before these hills and mountains around us, that we have offered him unto you this day. Ye that are free of cesspain, will ye take him? <coughs> ye that are free of the bond now tendered by the enemies, Will he accept of him this day when the old professors are taking offence at his way and cross? Oh, will you cast your eyes upon him? Angels are wondering at this offer. They stand beholding with admiration that our Lord is giving you such an offer this day. Oh, come, come then unto him, and there shall never be more of your bypassed sins. They shall be buried. But if he will not come unto him, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for you. That is the biblical free offer that the reformers, Puritans, Covenanters believed. And so should we.